In uh, 1967, I was a Marine in Vietnam. Since 1993, I've been involved with different projects in that country. They include raising funds for school construction with members of my old outfit in the province where we once fought, helping bring together veterans who wanted to return war souvenirs that they had taken from the dead, sometimes from people they had killed, to families for whom those killed were still missing in action. I worked on radio documentaries, feature films, editing and adapting a series of translations of Vietnamese story collections and novels for publication in the U.S. and vice versa. There are hundreds of Vietnam veterans I know who are engaged in similar activities, healing both for themselves and for the Vietnamese. What I want to talk about this morning is what brought me into that work of reconciliation. The theme of these TED Talks is community, so it would be right to ask what such reconciliation has to do with community. One answer has to do with a very old form of trauma called by a new name, moral injury. Moral injury occurs when soldiers do what they're supposed to do, that is kill other human beings. For a normal person, the ability to kill has to do with the ability to form a second self, one which survives in part by dehumanizing the enemy. It's what the poet Doug Anderson calls finding your snake brain. While seeing the enemy as being outside the pale of humanity may be necessary for most normal people in order to function in war, still, in dehumanizing the enemy, they lose some of their own humanity and may come to see themselves, or others may come to see them, as wearing a kind of leper's bell that keeps them outside the community. Healing from moral injury is about reconnecting with a moral community, feeling connected to your fellow man, said Molly Bohm, a former case manager for recovering Marines and soldiers at Walter Reed. One way to find one's own humanity, the way I'm speaking about this morning, is by knowing each other's stories. Experience what it's like to be another person through the empathetic immersion that's possible in good fiction can help us erase the deepest divides between people, and in doing so can be a way of healing. In the summer of 1993, I sat across a breakfast table from a woman I once would have killed, as she once would have killed me. We were there as part of a program, <coughs> excuse me, sponsored by the William Joyner Center at the University of Massachusetts, which brought together American and Vietnamese writers who'd been on different sides of the war. We met, did programs and readings together, lived together in the same house in Dorchester, gradually came to the point where we stopped seeing each other as symbols of our respective past histories, but instead as people who shared the complex nature of any human beings, and who respected, and in most cases, liked each other. The woman with whom I was sharing that breakfast table was Lehman Quay. She'd been a North Vietnamese soldier who had been in the war from the age of 16 to 19, working as a youth volunteer on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, defusing or exploding American bombs, guiding soldiers south, and burying the dead. Later she became a war correspondent for that side. As the American and Vietnamese writers got to know each other, at some point the question that would always come up was, where were you, when were you? Ascertaining if these dates and locations might have crossed with our own, in the war, if we or they, in other words, were people who had once had the chance to try to kill each other. Gradually, we had all spoken of our time in combat, but Lady Quay had been reticent about that subject until the morning when I suppose a certain level of trust had been achieved between us, and she seemed to want to speak about her war and find out about mine. Where were you? When were you? She hated the helicopters the most, she said. I'd been a helicopter gunner, and as we spoke, I recalled a mission when we 
were flying over an area where she could have been working, and I had fired into the jungle at some unseen target. I realized at that moment, sitting at that table, that if she had been there, I could have killed her. Indeed, if I had seen her, I would have tried my best to kill her. It was as if, for me, her human face emerged from the thick, obscuring foliage of that jungle that we had flown over. At the same moment, she realized that what to her had been the helmeted, inhuman figure in the terrifying machine over her head that she wished would be shot down and crash in flames could have been me. We had suddenly moved out of whatever myths we were in each other's minds and became human to each other. It was something that brought us to a feeling of grief, as if we truly had killed each other and the realization of what we would have lost. The two commonalities we had that drew us deeply together were the fact we were veterans and the fact we were writers who had tried to deal with the war in our writing. For the first, as veterans, in spite of being on different sides, we found two decades after the fighting was over that the experience of being in the war and coming home from it to a public in both countries, either largely indifferent or determined to see the war according to their own preconceived notions of what it should have been, made us feel in many ways closer to each other than to our fellow countrymen. For the second, we had become writers, as I wrote then, because we thought we were good at it. But, we were also, but we'd also become writers because we knew in the deepest sense the way in which simplifying human beings and human situations to the priorities of power or convenience or wishful thinking could lead to death and degradation. We'd become writers, in other words, for the reasons any good writers do. We wanted to tell stories that showed the complexities of the human heart its capacity for both love and brutality. We wanted to show the human faces under the leaves, under the noise of the rotors, under the hatred and fear that distorted those faces into configurations of hatred and fear. We, need, we knew deeply, those of us who were in the war, that to not write about these things was the beginning of moral death and murder. What we held in common then was a compulsion to act as witness, to insist in our art that here was the reality of war and its aftermath. What we came to as writers was how stories, literature, enabled us and enabled readers to enter into the inner lives of characters and how would it be if Americans and Vietnamese could, through stories, have that experience, share, in essence, what we experienced at that table. It was this that led Quay and I to decide to put together an anthology which would bring together not only the work of American writers and Vietnamese writers who had been our enemies, but also those Vietnamese from the refugee community who were our allies. We invited Trung Hong Sun, a former South Vietnamese Army lieutenant who had come to the States as a boat person, as a refugee, and became both a literary scholar and a NASA scientist. Three of us would eventually decide to call the book The Other Side of Heaven, post-war fiction by Vietnamese and American writers. The way that book came about is a long and complicated story involving usual problems of selecting and editing the stories, finding a publisher, getting reprint permissions, editing translations, etc but also clandestine mailings, deflections, dodging censorship, threats of retaliation from both the authorities in Vietnam against Quay and from the overseas Vietnamese community against Sun, both before and after the book came out in 1995. The royalties from the book were initially designated to a women's health center in the city of Hue Hospital, and subsequently the project Renew, an organization that helps educate and, slide there, sorry, 
to both educate and warn people about unexploded ordnance and landmines and locates and disposes of those deadly leftovers of the war that are still seeded into the earth by the thousands in one of the provinces where my outfit fought. In addition, along with Quay and contributor and another North Vietnamese Army veteran, Hoang Thai, we did a nationwide book tour from San Francisco to Seattle, Minneapolis, New Orleans, Ohio, Washington, D.C., New York City, reaching audiences of hundreds of people. In each place, we were met by veterans, some American, some Vietnamese from the overseas community, some of whom cursed and spat at us, some of whom wept and embraced the North Vietnamese writers as if they had found their twins. It was the same with the stories. When I had finally gotten all the manuscripts together and had to decide on an order for them, I found a strange, or, or maybe not so strange, synchronicity was taking place. Not only did selections echo each other thematically, but often situations or characters would seem to leap from one story to another. Ward Just and Bao Ning, both write about writers, one in Washington, one in Hanoi, unable to let the war go, struggling to find ways to write about. The woman in Nada, Judith Ortiz Kofer's powerful story of grief loses a son named Tony in the war. In Layman Quay's story, Tony D, two Hanoi hustlers find the bones of a dead American who begins to haunt them. They identify him as Tony from his dog tags. They go through laps waiting for a friend, is told by the ghost of a, nor of a dead North Vietnamese soldier, who with his other dead squad mates observes the life of the lone surviving member of their unit, just as the ghost in Larry Heinemann's Paco's Dreams observes and comment on the life of Paco, the only survivor of their unit, as if he's living for all of them. The stories fell together like lost pieces in a puzzle. And of course, in truth, that quality is not strange. A soldier's bitterness and alienation or cynicism at the way truth is twisted after the bullets no longer fly, a mother's grief, a spouse's rage at the loss of ability to love, a child's sense of aching absence. These are the losses, the costs of war that echo back and forth that unify the stories, that finally unify us. Uh, that's a child's drawing from uh, that province where all these mines and unexploded ordnance are still, uh, still killing people you know, all this time after the war. Stories can save us, wrote Tim O'Brien. We must teach each other to love, Lehman Quay said, so that we will never go to war again. Each story brings us a human face. Each story brings us our own face. The stories enter us, become a part of us. Afterwards, we can never look at each other in the same way again. In the commonality of loss and pain, defeat and occasional triumph that make up all good stories, we see each other's human faces emerging from the leaves of the jungle canopy, from the blankness of the sky. Thank you.